What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, and my name is John. And this week, we are back with episode 128, where we will be analyzing and predicting the UFC fight night going down this Saturday, December 19th, 2020, headlined by Stephen Wonderboy Thompson versus Jeff Neal. This 12-fight card will take place from the UFC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada, which means it will take place in the small UFC cage. Just a quick recap, the last event, I did go 6-3-1 on official predictions on the podcast last week and profit 4.35 units on my official bets for the night, so it was a very successful night of bets for me. I hope to close out the year of 2020 with one last profitable event. Although this card doesn't have that many great betting spots, I will still analyze and predict all these fights and talk about the betting lines for all the fights as well. This event will conclude a five-month consecutive streak of UFC events. There has been a UFC event every single Saturday since July 11th, over five months. So if you have been listening to the podcast during that time, I really appreciate it. I'm sure we're all feeling a little bit burnt out having to tape study and to analyze fights 20 weeks in a row. I know I am looking forward to that break we have in the next few weeks. There's not a UFC event for four weeks, so we won't be back until I believe it is January 18th of 2021. So just want to give a quick thank you to everyone who has listened, and we will close it out with one last great card of 2020. So we're going to get right into analyzing the first fight on the card. This fight is a 160-pound catchweight fight between Christos Yagos and Carlton Minus. The opening betting line for this one was Yagos minus 325 to minus plus 250. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Yagos minus 330 to minus plus 270. Even though Christos Yagos is coming in here on about three days notice, he is still an over 75% favorite. And that sounds a bit crazy, but to be honest, I think it's about accurate. I'm really unimpressed with what I've seen from Carlton minus. Minus showed some decent skill on the regionals against pretty poor competition, some decent striking, ability to stuff takedowns, but when he's fought better fighters, good athletes like Semmelsberger, he got pretty dominated in his UFC debut by Semmelsberger, got taken down, outstruck, got pretty dominated for the first two rounds of that fight, and did fight his way back into it a little bit. He did have a decent round three where he definitely didn't quit and came forward throwing some volume, so... I could see this fight playing out a similar way where Yagos wins the first two rounds convincingly. I do believe Yagos is the better striker and the much better grappler. He should hit pretty easy takedowns on Carlton Minus. But Yagos is known for kind of gassing out and slowing down later in fights. So I think that Yagos could struggle a bit with the cardio, especially coming in here on short notice. But I still think he will do enough to win the first two rounds convincingly. I doubt he finds a finish. He hasn't had a finish in about four or five years. But Yagos could be so much better on the mat than Minus. He could find a submission somewhere along the line. So I'm not completely ruling out a finish. Although my official prediction is going to be Yagos by decision. I think he probably gets a 10-8 in the first two rounds and wins a 29-27 or something like that. So the pick is Yagos in a pretty lopsided decision. And I have no bets on this fight. No interest in betting this one. It's a complete pass for me. It was put together on three days notice. There's no reason to bet this fight. The next fight takes place in the flyweight division. We have Cody Durden taking on Jimmy Flick. The opening betting line for this one was Flick minus 155 to Durden plus 135. Right now we are seeing Flick minus 152 to Durden plus 132. This fight was supposed to happen about two weeks ago, I believe. Both men weighed in, made the 125 pound weight limit, but the fight got canceled because Durden had pink eye, I believe. And they are rescheduling it a few weeks later. So I won't spend too much time on this fight because I did analyze it on the last podcast. And I don't think my thoughts have changed much. Durden is dropping down to 125 pounds. He fought his UFC debut at 135 pounds. Both of these fighters are definitely most comfortable when grappling. Durden comes from a wrestling background. Flick comes from a jiu-jitsu background. Both of their striking skill is pretty bad in my opinion. I think Durden is a little bit better, but not by a wide margin. I think anything could happen when these two are striking on the feet. Flick doesn't really have much striking at all. It just throws an occasional leg kick and maybe some wild punches, but no real striking at all. While Durden can at least stand at distance and fight a kickboxing type of fight like he did against Gutierrez, although he did get cleanly outstruck in that fight. I think this fight mostly comes down to Durden's takedown defense. We know he comes from a wrestling background. We've seen his offensive wrestling, but we have not really seen his defensive wrestling tested before. And Flick is going to want to take him to the mat and try to get his submissions going. And Flick is really good with submissions. He can transition between different submissions very well. And I'm pretty impressed with his submission skills. Although he doesn't really control his opponents too well, he definitely favors submission over position. 
I definitely do not think that Flick can win the fight if it stays in the feet, so he's going to need to get the fight to the floor in order for him to win that way. While Durden could probably win if it's on the feet, and he could possibly win if it's on the mat as well by just staying in top position, not getting submitted, and winning the rounds that way. So I think Durden has a little bit more ways to win, but I still got to go with the path to victory for Flick, and that is getting takedowns and getting a submission. I just think that we will see Flick be another level on the mat. He's going to be able to work through those transitions and scrambles a lot better and he's going to be a lot more dangerous to finish the fight somewhere along the lines and even if Durden is in top position if he he is the one hitting takedowns and landing ground and pound from top he's still going to be in danger from getting arm barred or triangled or submitted in any form and I think that we will see Flick be the better overall grappler and probably find a submission somewhere along the lines the last time this fight was booked two weeks ago, the price on Durden was a lot better. I think he was above plus 150, and at that price, he might have been worth a small bet, but where it's at now, I think the line is about right, and there might even be some value on Jimmy Flick. I do think he gets those early takedowns and probably gets out to a lead in round one, so he might not be a terrible bet as a favorite, but I'm not quite ready to trust him as a favorite. He is a contender series guy. After all, he hasn't fought that great competition. And Durden will be a pretty tough matchup for him. So I'm expecting a close competitive fight where eventually Flick finds a submission in the grappling scramble somewhere along the lines. It's not a confident pick, but I'm going with Flick's submission round two. The next fight takes place in the middleweight division. We have Tafan Chukwi taking on Jamie Pickett. The opening betting line for this one was Chukwi minus 256 to Pickett plus 205. Right now, over on Pet Online, we are seeing Chukwi minus 315 to Pickett plus 265. Both of these guys are making their UFC debut, so I'll give a little background on them in case you're not too familiar with them. Pickett is a southpaw who has pretty raw and sloppy striking. I think he's best when hitting takedowns, but he's not that great of a grappler. I really think Pickett is pretty sloppy in all areas of MMA. Seems to tire down late in fights as well. I think Chukwi looks a lot more promising. He can strike from both stances, has pretty clean technique when he's striking as well. He got a great knockout on the Contender Series, although that was against a pretty low-level opponent who was like a whole weight class below him. And he did get hit with some punches from Matavo as well. So Chukwi doesn't seem to have great striking defense, but he can still high guard and roll with the punches a little bit and avoid those big power punches. And Shukwi also stuffed a takedown from William Knight, showed some pretty good takedown defense, good clinch striking in that fight as well. He had really good frames and knees and elbows in that fight, so I think that Shukwi is a pretty skilled fighter in the clinch. So I am struggling to see where Pickett has any advantages in this fight. I think the distance striking has potential to be competitive. These guys are both big, athletic, powerful guys, so knockouts are possible on only end, but I think that Tafon is the cleaner distance striker. He's certainly the better clinch striker. And if Pickett tries to take Chukwi down, I think Chukwi's takedown defense and clinched knees and elbows will be enough to stop Pickett from getting those takedowns. And even if Pickett does land a few takedowns, I do not think that he will keep Chukwi down or get a submission or do anything meaningful with the takedowns. Chukwi should just stand back up. I think this betting line is about accurate. I capped Chukwi in the 70-75% to 75% range. I don't knock a play on Pickett at these odds because I do think it is dog or pass at these money line odds. There's no way you can be laying over minus 300 on a contender series guy who is only 4-0. Pickett does have more experience. And even when Pickett is losing fights like his contender series fight, he can turn it around, land some hard punches, and end the fight just like that. So Pickett does have the potential to end it with a knockout at any time. But outside of a knockout, I see, struggle to see Pickett winning this one. So the pick will be... Tafan Chukwi by knockout in the second or third round. I really think those clinch strikes will add up, will drain the gas, and will be a late knockout for Chukwi. So maybe look into those two, three props for Chukwi, maybe the over one and a half here, but no official bets for me on this one yet. The next fight takes place in the women's flyweight division. We have Jillian Robertson taking on Talia Santos. The opening betting line for this one was Santos minus 125 to Robertson plus 105. Right now we are seeing Robertson minus 113 to Santos minus 107. More action coming in on Jillian Robertson. She is now the slight favorite. She opened up as the slight underdog, so we have seen the line flip. But there is two-way action coming in on this fight. Very close competitive fight. I'm looking forward to this one. I don't think anybody would dispute that Santos is the better striker and Robertson is the better grappler here. 
I think that Santos is a bit more capable of a grappler than Robertson is as a striker. So if the fight goes to the floor, we could see it be slightly competitive. We could see Santos threaten with submissions, get back up to her feet. Meanwhile, when it's on the feet, when it's in the striking range of things, I do expect Santos to be winning those exchanges pretty clearly. She has good, consistent offense. She targets the body a lot with long front kicks and good knees. I was really impressed with what we saw from her in the Molly McCann fight. She really dominated every aspect of that fight. She outstruck McCann at range in the clinch. She took her down, kept her down. I do think that that win is getting a bit overvalued by the market. Santos was an underdog in her last fight. She dominated that fight. But people are forgetting that Robertson was able to dominate Molly McCann just as easily. So although Santos did show a vast array of skills in that fight, that was against pretty inferior competition. Jillian Robertson is a massive step up in competition. Based on what I saw from Santos in the Barella fight, she was backed up to the cage very easily in that fight. Barella didn't even have to throw any offense or disguise or takedowns. She could just walk forward and Santos would walk in a straight line back to the fence. Spent a lot of time in that fight with her back to the cage. She got taken down. She did not look good off of her back. She got taken down to the end of round one and for about two and a half minutes she just stayed in guard and went for rubber guard and that's not going to work against Jillian Robertson. Robertson will pass you. She will land ground and pound she'll mount you she'll be looking for submissions so i do think that once this fight hits the floor we will see jillian robertson maybe two levels ahead i really think that robertson will get her down will pass her guard and will probably find a finish somewhere along the lines on the mat i mean robertson is a great finisher most of her wins in the ufc have come by way of finish i think the botello fight in her last fight was the only time she has won by decision in the ufc i also got to mention that i think robertson has been looking a lot better on the feet as well I don't think her striking is showing massive improvements. It's not like she's landing a lot of offense, but she looks a lot more comfortable in her movement on the feet. Her footwork looks better. She's timing her takedowns better, setting up those takedowns, and she's actually pretty good at catching kicks as well. So I mentioned earlier, Talia Santos likes throwing kicks and knees to the body. That's going to be dangerous to do here versus Robertson because Robertson can catch them, turn them into takedowns, and then once Santos is on her back, she could lose the round. She could get submitted in within the round. So it's going to be dangerous for Santos to throw those kicks without them getting caught. When these two women are striking, I do expect Santos to be landing the better strikes on the feet and winning the round in the eyes of the judges. And if Robertson can't get those takedowns, we might actually see a finish from Santos because her nonstop offense, the way she targets to the body, she's a very hard hitter. And if Robertson can't get those takedowns, she's a bit lost at times. But I do not trust the footwork of Talia Santos to keep her back off the cage. I think that Robertson is going to come forward, going to get her back to the cage, going to chain together a lot of takedown attempts, and eventually will get Talia Santos down to the mat where Jillian Robertson will start implementing her top game, will likely pass that rubber guard of hers, mount her, land ground and pound, go for submissions, and dominate from top position. So I'm going to trust Jillian Robertson in this one. I trust her strength the schedule a little bit more i think that she has the more reliable path to victory here with those takedowns and i do not really like what i've seen in terms of defensive grappling from talia santos so i think that this fight could get dominant late for robertson i think a finish on the ground in rounds two or three is very live for jillian although a decision is also possible she was dominating batello in the last fight was 10 aiding her in the last two rounds but was not able to find a finish so it's possible that robertson dominates but still doesn't find a finish so I'm going to go with Jillian Robertson round three submission as the official prediction. And at these money line odds, I still think there is some value on Jillian Robertson. I would actually cap her closer to 55 to 60% here. It's a close competitive women's fight. I'm looking forward to this one, but I'm trusting the grappling of Jillian Robertson to get it done here. The next fight is at a catch weight of 195 pounds. We have Antonio Arroyo taking on Duran Wynn. The opening betting line for this one was Arroyo minus 175 to win plus 150. Right now, we are seeing Arroyo minus 160 to win plus 140. There is two-way action coming in on this fight with a little bit more on Duran Wynn's side, and I agree with that action. First off, we got to mention that Arroyo is going to have a massive size advantage over Duran Wynn. He's going to be 9 inches taller. That is right. Duran Wynn is 5'6". Arroyo is six foot three. And I think that outside of a Stefan Struve fight, this might be one of the biggest height differentials in UFC history. So that's going to be really weird to see. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. 
In the striking here, I actually think that this will be pretty competitive. I think a lot of people are assuming that Arroyo is the better striker, no question. He has that southpaw striking. He's got a very fast body kick, but he doesn't land too many punches to the head. He doesn't really have consistent offense. He kind of slows down later in fights. And the takedown defense shown by Arroyo in the Muniz fight was really pathetic, honestly. I think Arroyo looked particularly bad in that fight. Maybe had some UFC jitters for his UFC debut. And I think he will look a little bit better here. But I find it hard to bet Arroyo as a favorite after his takedown defense looks so bad against Muniz. And considering that Duran Wynn shoots a pretty high amount of takedowns. Now, Duran Wynn is a much different grappler than Muniz. Muniz is a much better control grappler, better jiu-jitsu, and Duran Wynn doesn't really have much of a top game. He just kind of lands takedowns and doesn't really know what to do with them afterwards. He might land a few ground and pound shots, might keep you on your back for a few seconds. But if Arroyo just focused on getting right back up to the feet and getting back to striking like Darren Stewart was able to do, then he should be able to stand up from those takedowns and not be in too much danger. I think there could be a possible problem if Arroyo decides to stay on his back and to attempt triangles or arm bars. He has hit those submissions in the past, but I don't think that he would hit them on win and he could just end up spending unnecessary time on his back. When this fight is in the striking, I think it will be close and competitive. I will give Arroyo a slight striking advantage because of his height, his reach. He's going to be throwing those hard southpaw body kicks, but Arroyo doesn't throw a tremendous amount of punches. Duran Wynn throws a lot of punches. He has a very high output. Not very technical, but he comes forward. He throws shots. He's pretty tough and durable. Gerald Mearshart was able to stop that pressure of win to outstrike him, to hurt him with strikes along the fight, and eventually take him down and submit him in round three. But I don't think Arroyo has really proven that level of striking yet where I think he can replicate that same game plan. I think Arroyo's best chance at winning early is just by an early knockout, landing some hard body kick, and hopefully just getting Duran Wynn to shell up. But in my opinion, I think Duran Wynn will hit early takedowns here, will look like a decent bet as an underdog, and actually has potential to win the first two rounds of this fight on his way to a decision. Decision. Based on how bad Antonio Arroyo looked in the Muniz fight, I don't think there's any way you could be betting his money line here. A lot of people got in on the Antonio Arroyo knockout prop that was at a plus 700, plus 600 price earlier in the week, but it's been bet down to plus three or 400. There still might be some slight value there. If Arroyo is winning this fight, I do think it is by knockout. I don't trust his cardio in the later rounds. I don't trust him, his volume enough to win a decision. So if Arroyo is winning the fight, clearly it is by knockout. Well, I think that Win has a much better chance to win this fight via decision. And the longer the fight goes, I think I trust the cardio, the output, the wrestling, the takedowns of Duran Win more. So I'm going to go ahead and pick Duran Win to win this fight as an underdog. I'm going to pick him to win by decision. I never thought I would make this pick because I thought Duran Win was a pretty bad fighter. He lost his past two fights against Mearshard and Stewart. Didn't look good in either of them. But I think he's shown the necessary skills. He has the takedowns. He will present some problems for Arroyo. And he will probably look like a good underdog bet unless he gets starched immediately. So the pick for me is actually going to be Duran Win by decision. Haven't locked in a bet on him as an underdog yet. Don't know if I will officially, but I do like his uh, odds as an underdog. The next fight takes place in the women's bantamweight division. We have Panny Kianza taking on Sajara Eubanks. The opening betting line for this one was Eubanks the favorite at minus 175 to Kianza at plus 150. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Eubanks minus 153 to Kianza at plus 133. More action coming in on the underdog in this fight, Panny Kianzad, and I'm going to disagree with the action. I think that where the opening line was set was more accurate than where the line is at now. This is a pretty easy fight to break down in my opinion. The striking will be competitive, although I do give Penny Kian's at a slight striking advantage. Eubanks will compete on the feet. She throws volume. She has decent technique. She comes forward. So the striking will be competitive, but a slight advantage to Kian's ad. And the grappling advantage, I think, goes pretty heavily in favor of Sajara Eubanks. She has hit takedowns on all of her UFC opponents, except for Ketlin Vieira in her most recent fight. Eubanks doesn't have the greatest wrestling, but she's kind of similar to Claudia Gedalia in the sense where she will shoot on her opponents, and even if she doesn't have a great shot, she would just use a ton of muscle and lift her opponent up and slam them somehow, and she usually ends up getting takedowns, even if they're not the most clean takedowns. So I think the fight really comes down to Panny Kianzad's takedown defense. Will she be able to stop the takedowns of Eubanks? Because if she does not, I believe that Eubanks will take her down, outgrapple her, win rounds and be able to win a fight either by decision or submission that way. And if Eubanks can't get those takedowns, if it stays in the feed, then I do expect Panikian's had to land the better strikes and to edge a closer decision. 
but I definitely got to think that Eubanks has the more decisive path to victory. I think that if she's hitting takedown, she's going to be clearly winning the fight and likely decisively wins. While even if best case scenario happens for Kianzad, even if she does stuff those takedowns, she still has a very marginal path to victory by winning a close striking decision where a lot of variability is in play. I gotta give credit to Sujar Eubanks for improving her cardio. I think it's safe to say that she has improved her cardio. She has won round three in all three of her most recent fights. Cardio was definitely the biggest criticism of Eubanks in her early career. She tried making that 125 pound limit. That took a lot out of her and she didn't have too many great cardio performances. She even had a bad cardio performance against Besh Gohea, winning round one of that fight and gassing out and losing rounds two and three. But I think it's safe to say that she has improved that and it might be resurrected at this point. I mean, she was losing rounds one and two versus Caitlin Vieira. Close competitive rounds, but she did lose them and she still had the will and the cardio to come back and win round three. So... I'm actually feeling pretty good about Sajar Eubanks in this one. I would actually cap her closer to minus 200, around 65%. I just do not trust the takedown defense of Panny Kianzad to stop those early takedowns. And once she gets on her back, I do expect Eubanks to do good things from top position, a pass to attempt submissions, and she should probably run away with the fight after that. In terms of bets for this fight, I do think there is value on Eubanks' money line, but the money keeps coming in on Panny Kianzad, so I would recommend waiting before locking in that action on Sajar Eubanks. I doubt I'm going to track a bet on this because I haven't been having great luck with betting women's mixed martial arts money lines too much lately, so I won't likely track this, but I might make a personal play on Sajar Eubanks, haven't decided yet, and I will kind of continue to monitor the line movement. Ultimately, I do think that Sajar Eubanks wins the fight via decision. She could find a submission somewhere along the line, so Sajar Eubanks by submission prop might have some value as well, but the pick is Sajar Eubanks here. The next fight takes place in the welterweight division. We have Alex Morono taking on Anthony Pettis. The opening betting line for this one was Pettis minus 330 to Morono plus 270. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Pettis minus 225 to Morono plus 190. More action coming in on the underdog, Alex Morono, and I agree with that action. Where that opening line was set it was way too wide, and I think the where it's at now is much more appropriate. It's actually pretty dead accurate. Pettis has kind of abandoned most of his early game, his flashy offense and crazy strikes and everything. It's kind of accepted the role as a counter puncher, has been a lot more low volume in his recent fights. So Alex Morono is definitely going to be the one leading here. He throws pretty consistent, steady volume. So it's going to be a close competitive striking fight where Morono is putting up more volume. I expect Pettis to be landing the cleaner, harder shots, having more effective striking going on. But it's going to be close in the eyes of the judges because of that volume disparity. I think that we could see Morono throwing two times as many strikes as Pettis. And even though Pettis is landing the better shots, I think that on optics, the judges could make the fight a lot closer than it actually is. So I'm actually expecting a close decision here. I could even see a split decision. And if you want to bet Alex Morono, just do it by decision. Take the decision prop. Morono doesn't finish anything. I mean, he was dominating Rice McKee in his last fight and still did not finish him. So I would be extremely shocked to see a finish from Morono here. I honestly think that the finish is around like 5% for Morono. I actually think that goes the distance line is a pretty good way to play this fight on both sides. It's around minus 170, around 63%. I actually think that this fight goes the distance at around a 70 to 75% rate. So goes the distance is a good way to play play both sides i'm ultimately expecting a close pettis decision here and in terms of money line it's dog or pass although like i said if you want to bet morono just take the decision prop so it might even be favorite or pass at these money line odds actually so once again the pick is pettis decision the next fight takes place in the heavyweight division we have marchin tabura taking on greg hardy the opening betting line for this one was tabura minus 135 to hardy plus 115 Right now, over on Bet Online, we are seeing Hardy minus 118 to Tabura minus 102. More action coming in on Greg Hardy here. He opened up as the slight underdog. The line has now flipped. He's a slight favorite, so needless to say, much more action coming in on Greg Hardy. But I'm going to disagree with that line movement. I mean, I think it's pretty clear as day that Marcin Tabura is the more skilled fighter. He is much more experienced. I really think that he is the better striker and grappler than Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy really just has that athleticism, that power. He is slowly improving his striking. He's getting better. He definitely has power in his hands that needs to be respected. But when analyzing this fight, I think that Marcin Tabura has a lot more ways to win the fight. He could edge the distance striking and win a decision. He could push Hardy against the cage and grind him out that way. Or he could hit takedowns and outgrapple Greg Hardy considering that Tabura is the much better grappler. And has actually hit takedowns on a lot of his recent opponents. 
I actually kind of forgot the fact that Tabura is on a three-fight win streak, and those three wins are actually over a pretty decent competition. He dealt with Spivak pretty well, was able to take him down, outgrapple him. He had a close competitive fight with Ben Rothwell, lost round one, came back well in round two, had a nice takedown in round three to win that fight decisively, and then he grinded out Max Christian against the cage, hitting some takedowns, pretty boring fight there, but he did what he had to do to win. So Tabura's been looking pretty good lately. And I think Hardy has been looking pretty solid as well, but I just see his path to victory here being pretty limited. He is going to have to keep this fight at distance to land strikes to win a decision or to land a knockout blow on Tabura. And Tabura is pretty tough. He can take a shot. I don't think it's going to be easy for Hardy to knock him out. And Hardy definitely slows down later in fights. I mean, he went for that early knockout versus Maurice Green. He looked to be slowing down pretty significantly in that fight. Still was able to find a finish in round two, but against a guy who is really good at sapping out your energy, who is good at pushing you against the cage, grinding you out like Marcin Tabura, gassing out late in fights is not a good thing to do. So unless Greg Hardy knocks Marcin Tabura out in the first few minutes of this fight, I think Tabura is going to find a way to get this fight against the cage or on the floor where he has big advantages over Greg Hardy and will likely win a pretty boring decision or find a submission somewhere along the line. So I like Marcin Tabur in this fight. I like picking against Greg Hardy. It's always fun to see that guy lose, but I think this is a particularly bad matchup for him. Tabur has many more ways to win the fight, and outside of a knockout for Hardy, I think this fight is Tabur. So I'm gonna go with Tabur by decision as the pick. Also, a submission is very live for Tabur as well. So. I haven't locked in any action yet, but I might end up with a play on Tabura Moneyline. Keep posting on my bet MMA tips to find out my official bets for this card. The next fight takes place in the bantamweight division. We have Rob Font taking on Marlon Marais. The opening betting line for this one was Marais minus 175 to Font plus 150. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Marais minus 147 to Font plus 127. More action coming in on Rob Font. I agree with that action where that opening line was set was too wide. If you got in on Font at plus 150, that's a great price. Font is coming off of a bit of a layoff. His last fight was a year ago against Ricky Simone. Great performance in that fight. His boxing looked sharp as usual. His takedown defense was great. When he did get taken down a few times, he bounced right back up to his feet. He had good pressure, output, cardio. I mean, really great performance from Rob Font in that fight. And then we got Marlon Marias, who's coming off getting knocked out by Corey Sandhagen just two months ago. That fight was October 11th, where he was pretty soundly beaten in that fight and then eventually got knocked out with the spinning back kick. It wasn't some vicious knockout, but considering the fact that he's doing the weight cut back to back, he got knocked out in that fight. He did not look good in that fight. I, think I thought he looked pretty slow. His speed, his physicality just did not look good in that fight. It's pretty wild that Marias is coming back in here so short notice. I fully expect a striking fight between these two. Neither guy are very likely to hit takedowns. And it's really going to come down to Rob Font checking leg kicks in my opinion. Because Font is pretty heavy on that lead leg. He throws a lot of jabs. Marlon Marais, one of his best strikes is his leg kick. So Font is going to have to have a good plan to deal with that leg kick. Because if Font's leg gets chewed up early, that could be it for this fight. Marais could run away with it. Could find a KO early. I definitely don't think that Font will make this look as easy as Corey Sandhagen did. I think that Sandhagen was a particularly awful matchup for Marias. The way that Sandhagen switched stances makes it very hard for Marias to get his leg kicks going. And Sandhagen was just unleashing straight punches and combinations on Marias in that fight. It was really a domination from Sandhagen. Font definitely won't look as dominant as Sandhagen did, but I still think that Font could implement a lot of the same tools that Sandhagen had success with, like his jab, like his combination punches, the pressure, getting Marais moving on his back foot is not going to be as easy to get off those leg kicks, those big head kicks that Marais likes throwing. This late into Marais' career, I think he's become very reliant on that round one power, hurting his opponents in round one, and if he can't hurt his opponents early, Marais starts to run out of ideas, his cardio starts to drop off. I saw a stat from my boy Chris earlier this week who said that Marais is 2-3 and three in fights in the UFC that go past round 1. He got finished in two of those fights, one of those losses was a split decision, and both of those wins were a split decision. So when the fight is going the full three rounds, Marais is constantly involved in close, razor-thin decisions. And considering that Marais is fighting a good pressure fighter with consistent volume, good cardio, good combination striking like Rob Font, I think that Rob Font has a great chance to weather that early storm in round one, avoid that knockout, and really put up pace and pressure on Marais, break him down in rounds two and three, possibly finding a late finish, but likely winning a clear decision, probably 29-28 decision for Rob Font. 
I think that he could even have a chance at getting a, a 30-27 or a finish. Like I said, I think that Marais is pretty much close to done in his career. I do not think he can compete at the elite level of mixed martial arts anymore. His physicality does not look good. His speed has dropped off, in my opinion. His durability doesn't look as good. So I might be writing Marais off a little bit too early, not giving him the credit he deserves. But I really like this matchup for Rob Font. And I have one unit on Rob Font at plus 126. I might add a little bit more, maybe a half a unit or one unit more. But I don't think you can go too crazy on the pre-fight money line here because, like I mentioned, Marais' best round is in round one. So if Marais has any success in this fight, it will likely be in the first three to five minutes of the fight. So you might get a better price on Rob Font in the live betting lines as well. Once again, the pick is Rob Font by decision. The next fight takes place in the welterweight division. We have Michel Pereira taking on Chaos Williams. The opening betting line for this one was Pereira minus 175 to Williams plus 150. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Pereira minus 118 to Williams minus 102. A lot more action coming in on Chaos Williams. I'm going to disagree with the action. I think that where the opening line was set was about accurate, but the market is loving Chaos Williams right now. I completely understand why Chaos Williams has two fights in the UFC, both of those being knockouts in under 30 seconds. But if you watch Williams' fights before he got in the UFC and after he got in the UFC, you might think that there's a different person in that body. Like they might have gotten switched out somehow because the Williams before the UFC was a decent striker at best, pretty sloppy, shot a lot of takedowns, kind of laid on top and stalled on top of guard a lot of the times. But I didn't see anything remotely impressive from Chaos Williams in his regional fights, but he's gotten in the UFC, he's gotten some good luck, gotten some swinging matches in the first 30 seconds and was able to knock both of his opponents out. But make no mistake, besides those early knockouts, Chaos Williams has shown nothing in the UFC. And if you go back and watch his fights before the UFC, you see a lot of sloppy technique. You see his cardio not look good in the later rounds, his striking technique kind of falls off he really thrives in brawls so as long as Michel Pereira doesn't oblige with him and trade in the center of the octagon Pereira should be able to run away with this fight I think that Pereira is the much more layered striker he's got the better accuracy he has looked good later in fights I mean he looked great in that last fight against Zalim Imadayev outstruck him for three rounds straight he looked extremely sharp in that fight Pereira, of course, does have problems with getting taken down. He was taken down and out grappled by a smaller guy and Tristan Connolly in their fight, but that was after he gassed out. He was hurting Connolly with some big punches in round one, went for the early finish, didn't get it, and gassed out. But I think Pereira has kind of learned from those mistakes a little bit. He looked very composed and was content to fight the full 15 minutes against Salim Imadayev. Pereira is the better mixed martial artist, in my opinion. He's the better striker. Chaos Williams has a small window to win this fight via knockout in round one to drag Pereira into a brawl and to use that massive power of his. He also has a minute chance to hit takedowns and to win the fight via top position, keeping Michel Pereira on his back. But if you combine those two outcomes with a knockout with the grappling, I really don't think that Chaos Williams has more than a 30 to 35% chance to win this fight. So I would actually cap Michel Pereira closer to minus 150 to minus 200 range. I probably will end up with a small play on him. I can't believe the odds are holding. People just keep betting Chaos Williams. There's a lot of hype behind him. The market is off on this one. I think that Pereira is the better fighter, the better striker. It will outstrike Chaos Williams to a decision likely. Could even see a late knockout, round two, round three knockout for Pereira if Williams starts to gas out. But I'll go with decision as my official pick. The next fight takes place in the bantamweight division. We have Marlon Vera taking on Jose Aldo. The opening betting line for this one was Aldo minus 125 to Vera plus 105. Right now over on Bet Online, we are seeing Aldo minus 145 to Vera plus 125. More action coming in on the favorite Jose Aldo in this one. And I'm going to agree with the action. I think that where the line is at now is pretty accurate. Aldo is one of my favorite fighters of all time, but make no mistake, he is far past his prime. He is fighting at a weight class that is not his natural weight class. He's cutting too much weight in my opinion. And he did look decent in the first few rounds against Peter Yan, but by round four, his cardio was gone, and he ate a massive amount of damage in that round five. Just a despicable stoppage by the referee, by Aldo's coaches. It kind of worries me that Aldo's coaches were allowing him to take that beating. I mean, when he was shelled up on his knees for two minutes straight eating nonstop punches, why don't the coaches throw the towel in? It seems like they have this blind belief in their fighter which is not something you want to see i want to see a realistic coach in someone's corner who knows how they can win the fight i mean the fact that they didn't throw the towel in in that fight when aldo was getting killed out there by jan i mean just 
disgusting, especially on the ref too. Disgusting performance from Leon Roberts. But besides that, you got to wonder how Aldo is going to look. I mean, the guy is already past his prime, fighting at a non-natural weight class, and he just ate a massive amount of damage from Peter Jan in that last fight. It's completely possible that Aldo will just look completely shot out here, and even though he shouldn't lose to a fighter like Marlon Vera, he might be so far past his prime that Vera might actually have a good chance to win this fight. If we could trust the Jose Aldo from the first three rounds of the Peter Jan fight to show up here, I would trust him to win that fight. I think he would outstrike Chito Vera, he would look good doing so, and win a fight via decision, possibly even finding a knockout. But with all those question marks around his age, his durability, his physicality, I do not think you can be betting him as a favorite. I, I know I said I agree with the early line movement. I do cap Jose Aldo around 55-60% to 60 here, but I'm advising you do not bet on Jose Aldo as a favorite. Now just to mention what Vera has been doing lately, he's been looking pretty solid. I thought he won that decision against Song Yidong, although the judges disagreed. He of course had that big win over Sean O'Malley where not much happened in that fight. He landed a few leg kicks and that kind of shut down Sean O'Malley's leg and that fight ended pretty quickly before we got to see it play out. But a win is a win. Vera did get his hand raised in that fight. And Vera has been looking very improved in all aspects of MMA. His striking, his clinch game, he's been getting those takedowns a little bit easier. He always has that problem of starting slow in his fights. He loses round one and kind of takes a round to wake up a lot of the times. But he better not do that here versus Jose Aldo because if you give Aldo a rhythm and you give him a lead, he might be able to win rounds one and two to a decision before his volume drops off in round three. I think it's pretty likely that Aldo wins round one here and I think it's pretty likely that Vera wins round three. So it's really going to come down to round two. It'll likely be a close competitive round. I think it's going to be a competitive decision on either end here. And I do expect Aldo to edge a close competitive decision. But I do not think he could be betting on him as a favorite. I think it is probably props or pass at this. I do not see much value on Vera's odds because he is a slow starter. There is always the chance that Aldo might turn back the clock and look very sharp. And if Aldo does look sharp and looks like the, the fighter from the Yan fight, then he likely does defeat Chito Vera here. But I think we're kind of playing the guessing game at this point on which Aldo is going to show up. And I think that at minus money as a favorite, you can't be guessing on Aldo to show up as a former version of himself. You also got to think about the takedown aspect from Marlon Vera as well. He's a solid grappler. He has decent wrestling. And Aldo does have historically great takedown defense. But I think all of his skills are waning. And it's possible that we might even see Vera take down Aldo and put him on his back. Not the most confident pick on my end. I'm going to side with Jose Aldo by decision. It would be great to see Aldo get a win, maybe retire with a win. But he is really towards the end of his career, and I do not have much faith in this uh, in this version of Jose Aldo. So not a confident pick, but I'm going with Aldo in a 29-28 decision. The next fight takes place in the welterweight division, and it is the main event of the card. We have Stephen Wonderboy Thompson taking on Jeff Neal. The opening betting line for this one was Thompson minus 115 to Neal minus 105. Right now, over on Bet Online, we are seeing Neal minus 121 to Thompson plus 101. More action coming in on Jeff Neal here. The line has flipped. We are now seeing Stephen Thompson as a slight underdog. And I'm going to disagree with the action. I think that Thompson is getting a bit disrespected here. The market is betting uh, the young up-and-coming guy in Jeff Neal. But I have not seen enough from Jeff Neal yet to put him as a favorite over Wonderboy Thompson. Just some quick notes about both of these guys. Stephen Thompson is 37 years old and coming off the longest layoff of his career. His last fight was in November of 2019 against Vincente Luque, but that was a great performance from him. It was a competitive fight early, but like Thompson always does, he's making reads, making adjustments, and by the end of the fight, he was really running away with that fight, outstriking, hurting Vincente Luque, and he was throwing a lot more punches than he uh, traditionally does in that fight as well. I was really impressed with the, the straight punches from Thompson in that fight, of course, the way he mixes up his combination strikes. And one quick note about Jeff Neal, he got COVID a few months back, and he's been dealing with some lingering effects. He was actually hospitalized in the ICU for some serious infection back in August. So around three or four months ago, he was out of the game for about a month, wasn't able to train, was recovering from an injury. I don't think that will have much of an effect on this fight, but I still think it's worth noting. I have to start by pointing out Jeff Neal's inexperience in relation to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. This is the first time that Jeff Neal has been scheduled to go the full five rounds. I don't know how many times Wonderboy's been scheduled, but it's been over five at least. And he has actually gone the full five rounds several times. So you've got to give a cardio advantage, an experience advantage in this five-round type of fight to Stephen Thompson. 
Neil is just kind of in general inexperienced late in fights. He's only had two fights that gone past round two in the past five years. One of those was against Kevin Holland where he was TKO'd in round three of that fight. And the other was a decision victory over Bilal Muhammad, which is probably his best win. I think that Bilal Muhammad is the best striker that Jeff Neal has fought. So there's going to be a massive step up in competition for Jeff Neal here. If you look at some of the guys that Jeff Neal has finished in his UFC career, Brian Camozzi, Frank Camacho, Nico Price, Mike Perry, those guys are so far apart from Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. I mean, those guys are wild brawlers without much technique, and Neal was able to deal with them accordingly, was able to finish them. But in terms of hurting and finishing Wonderboy Thompson, I don't think he's going to be able to. I think that the difference in their striking level is going to be so wide that we won't see Neal have opportunities to hurt Wonderboy Thompson. I consider Vincente Luque a more layered and skilled striker than Jeff Neal, and even Luque didn't have many opportunities to land clean punches or to hurt Wonderboy Thompson, so I see it being very difficult for Neal to do so here, and I think we're going to see a medium tempo kickboxing fight where we're going to see a kind of a levels to the shit type of thing from Wonderboy Thompson where he will outclass Jeff Neal, he will keep him at range, not let Neal get into the pocket where he can land his big punches, and we're going to just see Stephen Wonderboy Thompson out kickbox Jeff Neal to a decision it's possible we see a knockout in the later rounds rounds four or five thompson isn't the biggest hitter not the most power but that damage will accumulate we have concerns over jeff neal's cardio he has not been that full five rounds before so i think it's possible that the damage starts to accumulate jeff neal starts to slow down a little bit and we see a finish in rounds four or five by wonder boy but a prop for this fight i really like is wonder boy 4-5 decision that is available on FanDuel. I think that that is the best way to play this fight. I think that if it ends in the first three rounds, it'll likely be a knockout from Jeff Neal. And if it goes past the three-round mark, then it'll likely be a Wonder Boy 4-5 decision. So the pick for me is going to be Wonder Boy. I'm going to go with an official pick of a decision, Wonder Boy decision. And I think he wins this fight uh, pretty comfortably. So as an underdog here, I think you got to make a small play on him. I would cap him closer to 60 65% here. And I could be underestimating Neil here. It could be Neil's time. We might see Wonder Boy look a little bit older than he usually does, but I still think he's got enough left in the tank to get through this difficult matchup. And I'm going to be picking Wonder Boy Thompson by decision here. So that is going to do it for this episode, and that will do it for the Martian MMA podcast in the year of 2020. I don't know exactly how many UFC events we had. It's probably in the range of 40 to 42, but I made a podcast that analyzed every single fight before every single one of those cards. So I'm very proud of that accomplishment. I will do maybe a little bit of a recap podcast uh, before the next card, talking about maybe some big upsets, some best bets, worst bets, and uh, maybe my overall betting record for the year. But thank you all for listening to anybody who has listen this year it's been a great year of fights earlier on in the year we didn't know if we would have fights due to COVID-19 but the UFC has done a good job giving us non-stop fights so I'm grateful for that I'm grateful that we've had fights for these past nine months and it's been a pleasure analyzing fights this year on the Martian MMA podcast so I will see you all in the year 2021 for another year of analysis prediction and betting discussion before every single UFC fight that's going to do it hope you all enjoy the fights this weekend hope you all win some bets peace